So, uh, as we've already heard this morning, um, there is lots and lots of evidence for the use of anticoagulation in preventing uh, thromboembolism. And yet, data from the Euro Heart Survey shows that even patients looked after by cardiologists, only about 50 to 60% of patients who are eligible for anticoagulation on warfarin go on to take the medication. And nearly 40% of patients that at that time on the ESC and uh, AHA guidelines shouldn't have been end up on warfarin. So generally speaking, we're not very good at managing patients with warfarin. And hence the importance of uh, alternative medication. And now we've got three drugs that are an alternative to vitamin K antagonists, and that's rivaroxaban and pixaban, which works as TAN-A inhibitors, and dobigatran that works as a thrombin inhibitor. Now, the important thing about these drugs is that their uh, pharmacokinetic is far more predictable, and as a result, you can give the drugs as a fixed dose. And so there's no need for regular uh, INR monitoring. They have a rapid onset of action, which means that as soon as you think a patient needs anticoagulation, so for example, if they've had a DVT or a pulmonary embolism as well, they can be started on the drug and they're safely anticoagulated. Uh, and similarly, if the patient has a bleeding problem or needs any uh, elective surgery, you can stop the drug, and very quickly they are not anticoagulated and ready to proceed to whatever is required. So generally, monitoring is only needed in special circumstances. And importantly for the patients, there's no food or alcohol interactions. And for us, there are much fewer drug interactions. So this is a, a, a very exciting prospect. And the, the drugs have also been tested in uh, multiple uh, randomized studies. So dobigatran's being tested in the RELY study, rivaroxaban in the Rocket AF, and apixaban in um, the Aristotle study. And these are huge studies of you know, between 14,000 to uh, 18,000 patients. Now, all of these studies have gone on to show important benefits. So. Um, with the Bigatran, we found uh, on the higher dose a superiority for preventing uh, stroke and systemic embolism compared to uh, anticoagulation with warfarin. And with the Bigatran at the lower dose, it's uh, equivalent to warfarin. Uh, similarly, uh, rivaroxaban has been shown to be equivalent to warfarin, and apixaban to be uh, superior to warfarin. So these drugs are at least as good as warfarin and may be better. Some of this is driven by the actual reduction in uh, embolic stroke risk. So for the high-dose dobigatran, um, <clears throat> there's a reduction in the absolute rate of uh, ischemic stroke. But most of it is driven by the reduction in hemorrhagic stroke. So the fact that, unlike with warfarin, where INRs are going up and down, because these drugs have a much more predictable uh, pharmacokinetics, there, there isn't the same variation, and therefore the hemorrhagic stroke rate seems to be less. And also, importantly, um, major bleeding is um, reduced with the, the lower dose of dobigatran and with uh, apixaban. So major bleeding rates are reduced, but uh, the general rates of bleeding of those drugs are very similar. However, as a result of these very important uh, uh, reduction in ischemic stroke and reduction in hemorrhagic stroke, it's been very quickly adopted into the European guidelines as we've heard. And importantly, we see that um, the European guidelines recommend the novel oral anticoagulants as the best option. Okay? So it's not even an alternative to warfarin, it's considered to be the best option. So what is the impact of this going to be? Well, this should drive the overall rates of anticoagulation in the AF population because we've got good evidence to suggest that the drugs are you know, potentially better than warfarin. Uh, more importantly for the patients, they can now avoid INR clinics. They can travel without a worry. They've got the, the, they don't have to worry about alcohol and dietary restrictions. And lots of patients uh, are affected by the sort of cultural connotations that go along with anticoagulation. And maybe we can change uh, what we found from the EuroHeart survey where more patients that should be on anticoagulation uh, start these medication, and potentially uh, even the patients that back then were considered to be ineligible, it may be that because the risk-benefit ratio here is different, that the um, baseline criteria which we start anticoagulation may be changed with time. 
But the important thing is that all of this is going to lead to more patients being on oral anticoagulation. Now, no drug comes without a price, and the price that you pay with uh, the new or the novel oral anticoagulants is uh, is the GI bleeding. So, uh, although major bleeding is reduced, the overall rates of bleeding remain about the same, and this is partly driven by the increased rates of GI bleed. So, with uh, the bigger trend, higher dose, there's a higher rate of GI bleed. Similarly, a higher rate of GI bleed with uh, rivaroxaban and uh, equivalents with um, apixaban. Also, the drugs do have a significant discontinuation rate. So, uh, in the RELY study, nearly 15% of patients uh, stopped the medication. 25%, uh, nearly 25% stopped medication with rivaroxaban and Aristotle because of um, general side effects. And this isn't uh, that different to patient discontinuation with warfarin, which uh, Torsten has already alluded to. So what does this mean on, on, uh, on our society and those of us interested in appendage occlusions? Well, there's going to be a greater proportion of the AF population who are going to be taking the novel anticoagulators, I think. And on top of that, as uh, Prof. Kamas said, the population of AF is also increasing. The, as a result, um, if you're going to have more patients taking these anticoagulants, there are going to be some patients who are going to not be able to take it because of side effects. If warfarin gradually over the next five and ten years becomes used less and less commonly, doctors are going to become less familiar with adjusting INRs and they're going to become even more intolerant of uh, starting warfarin on patients that maybe can't tolerate the novel anticoagulants. So it's quite possible that warfarin just becomes uh, a pariah drug. So if you can't tolerate one of the novel anticoagulants, th there may be no option for these patients. On top of that, Remember I said that the overall rates of bleeding are about the same with these novel anticoagulants as with, uh, with warfarin. And if more patients are going to be taking novel anticoagulants, the overall number of patients with AF who have bleeding complications is going to go up with time. Now, most of us find that we already get a significant number of referrals from the neurologists and uh, neurosurgeons of patients who've had intracranial bleeds on anticoagulation. The number of patients that we treat with GI bleeding actually isn't as many as we think it is, and I'm going to sort of talk about that a bit more uh, a little later on. So the key things to take home at this point is that novel anticoagulants have similar risk of bleeding, though major bleeding may be less. The most common bleeding complications from the novel anticoagulants is GI bleeding. And when you think about how best to manage these patients, there's a, there's a real lack of randomized and prospective studies in patients who've suffered bleeds and how to manage them in terms of secondary prevention after bleeds. And for this group of patients, there aren't uh, appropriate risk stratification scores and definitions for bleeding. So if we uh, just focus in on the GI bleeds, because that's going to be one of the biggest groups of patients that we're going to see with time. Um, the data in this group is limited, and a lot of it is retrospective studies. And so let's look at what uh, studies there are out there and how the gastroenterologists uh, interpret these studies. So in this uh, retrospective study, looking at patients who have a thromboembolic risk and have been on anticoagulation, they've had a, a GI bleed, and then the physician has decided whether it's appropriate to continue anticoagulation or stop anticoagulation. So. 260 patients uh, resumed anticoagulation, and 182 patients uh, stopped their anticoagulation. In general, the patients that stopped anticoagulation after the bleed was for about four days. And what we see is that if you don't restart anticoagulation, there is a significant thromboembolic complication. And in this study, this was about half of these patients were strokes, and the rest were DVTs and pulmonary emboli. For those that did uh, restart uh, warfarin, what we see is that the uh, bleeding rate is higher if you're back on anticoagulation, but the study wasn't powered sufficiently to demonstrate a statistical difference there. 
So that's one study, it's a retrospective study looking at uh, stopping bleed. This is another study, again, it, they uh, retrospectively found the patients, but then uh, followed them up subsequently. And what they find is that when you look at the cumulative rate of major adverse events after a GI bleed, and then either stopping anticoagulation or restarting anticoagulation, what we find is that restarting anticoagulation is better for the patient. So the risk balance is that, yes, they've got a bleeding risk, yes, they've got a thromboembolic risk, but the thromboembolic risk is more important. However, there is a higher rate of recurrent uh, GI bleeding uh, in those patients that restart the anticoagulation. So those are uh, both quite small studies. Now, there's a, a big uh, audit of upper GI bleeds that's been carried out in the UK. And if we look at this uh, audit to try and get an idea of what's happening in real practice, um, the rates of upper GI bleed in terms of age distribution is about the same between those patients under 60 to, to going uh, above 80. Most of the patients that have GI bleeds um, have a hemodynamically stable bleed and without a significant drop in their HB. So that's the majority of GI bleeds that the gastroenterologists are seeing. And the a cause of the GI bleed is most commonly peptic ulcer disease and uh, esophagitis. But this is the, the, the key issue, is the drugs that are related to the, the GI bleed. So um, for all patients that present with a GI bleed, nearly 30% of them are on aspirin. Um, the next biggest group is the patient group on uh, NSAIDs. And you see that warfarin uh, comes third. So from the gastroenterologist's perspective, yes, warfarin is an issue, but the drugs they don't like are aspirin and the NSAIDs. So when we go to them and suggest we've got this uh, great solution, which requires long-term aspirin, this isn't something that uh, fills them with joy. And so that's something that we need to think about. And of course, many of us talk about clopidogrel as an alternative, but clopidogrel also has a rate of bleeding in this group of population, which is comparable uh, to warfarin. So what about the re-bleeding rates? Now, most gastroenterologists, gastroenterologists think of re-bleeding after the first bleed as being an issue more related to the underlying, um, uh, underlying diagnosis rather than due to the drugs themselves. And if it is due to the drugs, their, their belief is that aspirin and non-steroidals are more important. In fact, about 13% of patients will have a re-bleed, re and re-bleed is important because a quarter of those patients that have a re-bleed may die. But interestingly, in the re-bleeding group, the distribution of the drugs is much more similar. So, so although aspirin and NSAIDs seem to be very important in terms of the, the first bleed, uh, possibly because they've had some level of treatment, um, the relative contribution of them is less, and the warfarin becomes more significant. So it is an issue, and it does increase the GI bleed rate, but the interpretation of most gastroenterologists is that this is not a problem that, uh, that can't be dealt with, and they still feel that addressing the underlying pathology is the, the key issue. There are some studies of, uh, randomized studies of um, GI bleeding and management of GI bleeding, and in this one, which was specifically designed to look at the comparison between clopidogrel as an alternative to aspirin versus uh, giving a PPI, what they found was that clopidogrel, oops, sorry, that clopidogrel uh, resulted in an 8.6% uh, recurrent bleeding rate compared to aspirin plus the esomeprazole. So again, reinforcing the idea that treating the underlying problem with the esomeprazole is potentially more important than the drug itself. So where does this uh, leave us in terms of how we're going to uh, address uh, the next stages? So the key issue is that we expect more uh, patients within the AF population to start taking the novel oral anticoagulants. There's going to be a significant discontinuation rate, but we don't know whether this is a class effect and maybe patients are intolerant to 
rival rocks about may be able to take to bigger trend and vice versa. But we'll have to wait and see. I think most of us don't have sufficient experience of that yet. But the overall increased number of patients on anticoagulation will result in more bleeding patients that come to us. And the majority of those bleeds are going to be GI-related bleeds. And at the moment, I don't think we can answer the question of is aspirin worse than anticoagulation in this situation? And can we do LA occlusion without aspirin long term? And I think until we get somewhere in terms of answering these questions, it's going to be very difficult having those discussions with the gastroenterologists because we're not really um, offering them a solution for the sorts of problems they're facing. Thanks very much. Thank you.